Uh, about two and a half thousand years ago, a man named Plato told a famous story. It was about a band of human beings who, for as long as they could remember, lived their lives in a dark cave. Now, we, we would look at those human beings at, and we would say that their life was heartbreaking. Uh, they were chained by the legs and by the neck, so all that they could look at were the shadows on the cave wall. We would say those men were slaves. The thing is, they didn't know that they were anything of the sort. For as long as they could remember, this dark cave had been their life. Those shadows on the wall had, had been their world. The chains were just part of what it meant for them to be human. And if you came to one of those men offering them a key and telling them that on the outside was a whole beautiful world bustling with colour and laughter and love and life, they would have thought you were mad. They would have gone back to watching the daytime TV show of Shadows on the Wall. That for them was their real world. The cave was their prison, but to them the prison had almost become invisible. And according to Plato, a philosopher only would have been brave enough to explore the light. And then you'd be doomed to try in vain to lead others out into it. And if you'd force one of the men to turn around, the, the light would have been so bright and searing that they would have run back into the darkness. If you went back in pity to try and drag one of those inmates out into the real world, they would have almost certainly tried to kill you thinking the light has just driven you insane. And John 8, from verse 31 onwards, that was read to you, is an extraordinary story that has many similarities to what Plato said. Last week, you remember that we met the prisoners in the cave. Three times Jesus said that this world and all of us who belong to it will die in our sins unless we receive him as God. Because there's someone who's come down who is greater than any philosopher. The eternal son of the father. The only true light of the whole world. The very same burning light who led God's people out of the land of slavery all those centuries before. And led them into the land that promised eternal rest. Something's echoing, isn't it? Is it me? Or something's echoing. See if you can sort it out, lads. And today he, he offers those prisoners something truly wonderful who will follow his light. Jesus says, I can set you free forever to live in such a light. And light and love that you, you'd never want anything else. And, and best of all, what I can give you, Jesus offers, is the right to truly belong. No imposter syndrome. No doubts that one day it might be taken away from you through the Son. To be set free, Jesus says, is to be free indeed. You'll be a son forever in the Son. And that is a truly wonderful thing to give, isn't it? And yet, what is the response of the people in the cave? Well, when he pointed down at their claims last week, he's got their attention. Can you see verse 30? Many believed in him, but we've seen, haven't we, Jesus' scepticism of Israel's belief in this book. He knows what is in all men. And so today he, he talks to those new believers and verse 31 is addressed to people who seem to be believers and says, here is what it will look like if you are truly my disciples, those who listen to me and follow. This is what a disciple is, he's a follower. Those who follow where only the light of the world could lead out into truth and freedom. And almost immediately in verse 33, the prisoners in the cave begin to bristle with indignation. And by the end of the chapter, the people who believe in him in verse 31, can you see that? Are picking up stones to stone him in verse 59. It's an astonishing difference. Jesus has come to give something wonderful, and yet they cannot see it. In fact, they cannot bear it. Because the prison walls have become invisible to them. This world of sin and death and deceit 
is all they've ever known. Two things that John shows us as chapter 8 draws to a close, the depths of human need and the height of Jesus' grace. So first, verses 31 to 47, the depth of human need. Because the only thing more heartbreaking than being trapped in a prison of sin and death and deceit is to live in that prison thinking it's your best life now. And so here is Jesus' message to all of mankind. Even though you don't know it, you really do need to be set free by a true son. What is a true disciple? A true disciple is somebody who abides or remains in Jesus' word. And if you are truly my disciple, Jesus says, you will persevere following my life. Wherever I lead, that's the person who knows the truth and is set free by it. So can you see what real faith is? Real faith isn't just about believing certain things about God. It is more than that. Real faith is receiving and following the one who is truth. You can see that in verse 32. Can you see it? In verse 32, what is it that sets them free? What is it that sets us free? It's the truth. But in verse 36, who is it that sets us free? The son that sets us free. So there is a particular truth, isn't there? That sets free human beings, and that truth is Jesus himself. All that he was revealing about himself. So do you remember last time we saw that he is the divine son of God, the one sent from heaven to storm the walls of our prison and to lead us where only he could ever lead us into God's rest. It's as if Jesus has sawn through the bars of the cell window, he's tied together the bed sheets, and he holds out a hand to the inmates. And in verse 33, they immediately look at him and they say, What is wrong with you? This isn't a prison, this is a palace. Look at all the pretty posters I put up on my wall. How do you free someone? who will not accept that they're a slave. In Israel's case, it was a tragic false assurance that is holding them chained. They respond to Jesus and they say, we are Abraham's children. We've never been slaves. It's an absurd level of self-denial, isn't it? If there's one thing that's dominated Israel's history, it's been slavery. From the very beginning, they were forced to big bricks in Egypt, to the very end where they sat down by the rivers of Babylon and they wept and their captives, captors forced them to sing the songs of Zion. Now they know that. Obviously they are speaking, aren't they, in the spiritual sense. They're saying we might be slaves of Rome right now, but we're not slaves in here. We are the ones that God chose. We are Abraham's offspring. We are God's children. There's a sense, isn't there, of religious privilege that runs so deep in them that they can't even see their need. And that tragically can creep into a church like ours. I'm up to my neck in church. I get up early to serve. I, I, I make the co coffee. I, I stack the chairs. I, I play the music. I've done it all my life. I'm here to make sure that the church keeps going for the outsiders. It's them that need all of this. And so Jesus has to point out to you and I the monster that lives in our lives. That we've grown so used to that we, we don't see it anymore. The greatest slave master in the world isn't a government. It's not the Romans nor the Babylonians. It's not Vladimir Putin. The thing that holds human beings slaves is not the authoritarian rules coming out of the government. It's not cancel culture. It isn't poverty. It is not debt. The thing that enslaves us most is actually something that we quite like, which makes it the most addictive power on earth, sin. And you might think of your sin like a gambler thinks of his cards or his betting. You know the gambler, what the gambler, the gambling addict always says, and he says, well, I can stop whenever I want. 
The gambler thinks that he can control the cards. The gambler says, I can, I can walk away from it whenever I choose. And Jesus says, no, sin controls you. And its price is the thing that he pointed out so clearly last week. Because sin holds us, that eventually judgment and death will get the better of us. So however attractive life might look following our own rules, ultimately that life is slavery and not freedom. And it only ends one way. And if you don't believe it, try to go for one day. Pick tomorrow. Pick tomorrow. Try one day without thinking or feeling or doing anything that you wouldn't be ashamed of other people knowing. And you will know that you can't do it, can you? You might pretend not to see the prison walls, but we know that we're trapped. We are born, aren't we, into a self-centered world with bars on the window and on the doors. And even those of us who've been born into the most wonderful religious privilege on earth. If we're slaves, then all of that religious privilege is not something we will be able to cling on to forever. Think of a slave. A slave might live and work in a house, but that house is not his home, is it? At the end of the day, the slave just belongs to someone like property belongs. So he never really belongs to anyone. The slave can be sold on to the next person, whereas the son, the son belongs in a completely different category, doesn't he? And I wonder how much deep down the real ache inside of us is actually a longing to belong to someone. Because ultimately, that is what it means to be free. It's counterintuitive. So, so we think, don't we, of all those poor kids, some of you are in school with them, desperately trying to forge an identity to fit in. Maybe that's you. You're, you're desperate to fit in. So with one crowd, you're this person, and then in another crowd, you're another person. You're like a chameleon that fits in wherever they are. Desperately doing anything just to belong. Think of folk trying to pursue relationships, trying to find an identity in that, whatever the cost to them emotionally and to their souls. And we long for it. And so what a wonderful thing it is that the true Son of God came to give human beings. And he says, I will give you the right to be children of God, to belong. To belong where I have belonged forever. In the love that I have always known. It is, a, it is a belonging, isn't it? So deep, so secure that you will never have to worry about your place ever again. You don't have to earn it. The sun gives it to you. You will never again have to fear that if you put a foot out of line or wear the wrong clothes or get something embarrassingly wrong or misspeak or mess up in a shameful way that you'll be cast out of the group. Because to belong like that, that's freedom, isn't it? I wonder whether you realise, it's so strange, isn't it, that the most beautiful freedom we could ever get is not by going our own way, but by following someone else where he leads. That is utterly transformational. Do you realize that the most beautiful freedom you could ever know is not by going your own way, but by following somewhere else where, someone else where he leads and trusting him? And I suspect for most of us who are Christians this evening, that freedom is actually way more radical than we fully realize. Because he who, sets, who, he who is set free by the Son is free indeed. Do you get that? It doesn't mean you're sinless. Not yet. But something utterly radical has happened to your nature. Something utterly radical has happened to your identity. Suddenly, it is possible to break the habit. To break the hold that sin has. 
And all of a sudden, when you feel tempted and trapped by sin, it is actually possible to say, look who I am. I'm a son now and not a slave. I have the son living in me by his spirit. I can grow into this family of love to be more like my elder brother. Not perfect, not always, but I can truly say no. I can fight back. I can resist. There is never a sin that I have to say yes to. There is always an escape by God's grace. There is always a way out. And in a congregation like this tonight, there will be somebody that needs to hear that. We all need to hear that, don't we? That there is a way out. You don't have to say yes to your sin. And when I fall, and, and when I'm deeply ashamed... I can get up off the mat because I am as loved as ever I was. And and that is freedom. It's the most wonderful and the most radical thing that can ever happen to a human being. The day that you are adopted through the Son was your emancipation day. It's freedom day when you give your life to Christ. And the disciples who abide and remain are the ones who know that they've been set free. Would, wouldn't everyone want that? Well, no. No, everyone wouldn't, wouldn't want that, particularly if you refuse to accept the depth of your need. So Jesus makes his basic point in verses 37 to 38, where Jesus says to them, he says, your privilege does not make you as free as you think it does. Yes, ethnically, I, I know that you are children of Abraham, but you are not acting like free sons. In fact, verse 39, you you don't look anything like this family. You, You don't look anything like Abraham because the word came to you like it came to Abraham and I called you to follow me just like I called him. And what did you do? Well, verse 37, you sought to kill me. And that's not what Abraham did. But my word doesn't remain in you. In fact, it has no place in you at all. And then in verse 37, he says, what must be the most offensive thing that Jesus ever says, he says, a person's action flow from a person's origins. A person's actions flow from a person's origins. He says, like father, like son. And that implies your true paternal origins that your paternal origins are something radically different to mine he's telling them he's saying it might be Abraham that's written on your birth certificate and you're putting an awful lot of confidence in that turning down the chance of freedom because you think that you you were born into it but everything I see as I look at you tells another story it tells the story of another father There is a, that is a basic point. But it is a deeply offensive claim. Jesus is saying to the people of his day, you are not the children that you think you are. So verses 39 to 44, he lays out the evidence which makes him question their paternity so confidently. What, what makes a levy a levy? Uh, what makes a little a little? Or a loft house, a loft house. We all have family traits, don't we? You can spot a Levy child. Long face, dark hair, skinny. That, that's what makes a Levy child. You'll have that in your family. There'll be family resemblances, won't there? What makes a child of God a child of God? Uh, there's one killer family trait. Verse 42. Verse 42. If God is your father, you love Jesus Christ. No exceptions, because the Son and the Father look the same. In eternity, God the Son flows from the Father's very own nature. And here in time, 
God the Son has been sent to us by the Father in visible flesh and blood to storm the walls of the prison, to free us from death and sin and self forever. Who wouldn't love that? So the acid test of Abraham's children, God's true children, is that you love his true son. And when you hear the son speak, verse 47, you, you, you know straight away his voice. God's true children, number one, love the son who brings life. And number two, they love the truth when he speaks. But what does Jesus see when he looks around? Verse 40, he sees people who hate the son so much they want to kill him. And verse 43, they hate the truth so much they cannot bear it. Any more than those prisoners could bear the light in the cave. How dare you say we're slaves? They can't bear it. And they have all the family traits of the devil himself. Just as God the Son flows out of the Father's nature, so a hatred of the truth and a hatred of life flow out of the devil's own nature. Verse 44, he's been at it right from the beginning. The first words out of his mouth in Genesis are a lie about God's truth. And the first thing he did was plunge human beings into death, murder. A hatred of life and a hatred of the truth. And here's the most shocking thing of all. Human beings, you and I, by our nature, are so like him. So like that demonic spiritual father that his lies and his denial have become part of our native language. Look at verse 45. There's one word in verse 45 that is deeply strange and deeply alarming it's the word because it is because Jesus tells us the truth that we can't bear listening to him you, you've got to understand that if you're going to live today it's because Jesus tells the truth that people can't stand listening to him by nature we are such strangers to God that denial comes naturally to us and we cannot accept the Son who is goodness and truth itself. And so there are many, many people in this world whose belief is as heartfelt as those who are in verse 31. They believe in Jesus. The JWs might knock your door tomorrow morning and they believe in Jesus, but they won't accept him as fully God. Sincere liberals believe in Jesus but will not accept him as the one true light for all the world. And Jesus says that belief, however sincere, isn't saving belief at all. It's the kind of belief that the devil whispers in the ears of human beings day and night. Believe in Jesus by all means but do not worship him as Lord don't love him so there is the depth of human need even though we don't know it even though we are prisoners down here and blind we really do need to be set free by a true son in some ways it's such a gloomy message isn't it but I wonder whether hidden in the seeming hopelessness as the chapter closes you notice the remarkable goodness and kindness and strength we get to see in the way that Jesus responds to those people. His argument has been devastating. And all they can do, verse 48, is respond by hurling insults at him. First a racist slur and then a blasphemous one. There are some words, aren't there, that are truly shocking. And so talk to the school children here about when someone uses the N word in school. And even in a playground where kids have heard it all, that word still has the power to shock, doesn't it? <coughs> Truly shock. People don't put up with it rightly. And verse 48 is on that scale. First they throw the S word at Jesus. The Samaritan word, presumably because he's been questioning their legitimacy. The Jews and the Samaritans, they both claim to be legitimate children of God. And even worse... 
they then throw the D word at him. They respond to the truth himself, the grace of heaven himself, and they call him a demoniac. Demonic. But I do think in verses 48 to 59, we get to see the height of Jesus' grace, secondly. The height of Jesus' grace. Even though you insult him, John is saying there really is still time to rejoice in the eternal son, even now, even when you're as lost as they are lost. If you will abandon your lies and embrace the son with joy and confess it all to him and find a place to belong, do you see how incredibly kind and measured Jesus is to these terrible slurs? I'm simply speaking the truth, verse 49. I'm honouring what my Father has given me to say and you dishonour me, but I don't seek my own glory, verse 50. And here is why Jesus doesn't need to punch back. When they spit at Jesus, they spit at the Father himself. And the Father will one day judge all things, including everyone who dishonours his boy. And so Jesus can leave his own glory and his own honour to the judge. And instead, in verse 51, even now under these terrible slurs, even now he reaches out again. And he says, truly, truly, really, deeply. He says, urgently, listen to me. And he says, if anyone keeps my word and follows my life, even, even you now, you'll never see death. And he can be truly free. And that is remarkable. Which one of us would answer back like that? And he still does that tonight. He goes for the most hard-hearted insulter of Jesus you've ever met. The ones who maybe sit there and think they're already Christians. Do you realize tonight it's not too late to abandon the, the prism of lies? Take, take my hand, Jesus says, and live forever. But the response is to laugh. No human being can free us from death. Who do you think you are? Claiming to give a kind of freedom that even Abraham and the prophets never knew. Who do you make yourself out to be? And once again, the reply from Jesus, can you see it, is patient and restrained beyond belief. He's told them who he is repeatedly. And it's as if he says now, I, I don't need to answer that. The father who you claim to love and worship, he will glorify me one day. He will show you who I am. And maybe when I'm lifted up to die and enthroned on a cross, maybe then you will see it. If you knew him like I knew him, you would see that glory right now. And so here then is how you know someone has been set free from sin and death and the devil and belong to Jesus. You know it because you can see them rejoicing in him. What makes you a true spiritual child of Abraham? Abraham was a man who lived a long, hard life. He gave up his home, he gave up his land, he gave up his father's house. He got a lot of things wrong. But he was marked, according to Jesus, by one thing. And that was the joy that he gained. From a long way off, through all the shadows and promises, from a distance, Abraham saw the Son of God. He saw the lamb that God would provide to ransom his own. And Abraham believed God and it was credited to him righteousness. In other words, Abraham was freely forgiven. Abraham saw God the Son and he rejoiced. And because God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, Abraham is still seeing and rejoicing in Jesus Christ, even as Jesus spoke these words. And all that sounds utterly laughable to them. Come on, Jesus. Everyone knows Abraham was a hero back in the Old Testament. There's no Jesus in the Old Testament. It, it sounds laughable, doesn't it, to say Abraham saw Jesus. 
But if you know truly who Jesus is, then suddenly it is their words that are laughable. It is their words that seem like a joke. They look into the face of the Ancient of Days and they say to him, you're not yet 50 years old. How did you see Abraham? It's ridiculous, but remember it's always that way when people laugh at Jesus. Remember that this week. Remember that when they seem so confident and self-assured and Jesus' claims seem so laughable, but they are laughing from inside a prison cell. A prison cell which they cannot even see the walls anymore. Truly, truly, I saw you before Abraham ever was. I am. I am the eternal son who spoke to Moses from the burning bush, who led Israel behind that burning light and gave joy unspeakable to your father Abraham. And that same eternal son is the one who spoke that day and who speaks tonight. Who do you make yourself out to be, Jesus? I am who I am. And even now, it is not too late to rejoice in me. Just like your father Abraham did, but no, they won't. They pick up stones because what Jesus has said is so utterly clear that they cannot bear it. He's claiming without a shadow of doubt to be of one nature with the eternal God. And it's so blindingly truthful that the light burns. Sometimes, um, as a parent, when you've got a little one and they're trapped in an angry mess and, and they're screaming and kicking and shouting, all you can do is hold them tight while they fight. And there's something here, of, there's something of that here in the way that Jesus deals with these people. He is so strong and so kind and so glorious all in himself. Jesus doesn't hit back and defend himself. He just faithfully keeps offering them a way down, a way out of that blind, angry mess. And I think that's incredibly helpful to keep as a picture in our minds. That when people are lashing out at Jesus, what is it that they need? They need the Son of God to open their eyes. To help them out of the cave and we can invite them we can read the bible with them we can bring them to church but if we aren't praying for them then we've clearly not understood how dark the prison is and if we are here tonight this evening rejoicing in the sun that can only mean that he has done something absolutely wonderful for us he has stormed the walls and has set us free from our own web of lies Otherwise, you and I would be as lost as everyone else, and there's nothing to be proud of. But he who sets, he who the sun sets free, truly is free. You're home. And so when this week you feel trapped and guilty, or like an imposter that you don't belong, come, come and embrace the sun all over again. And remember who you are in him. Let's pray.